Hey class, get excited. We are talking about emotion. So think about an emotion that you have felt recently. Uh, it could be sadness. It could be fear. It could be joy. It could be anger, right? Maybe you've been getting into some internet arguments. Don't do it. Nobody ever wins, right? When you feel an emotion, so let's say it is anger, what are you feeling? Well, you have the thoughts, right? You might uh, have specific behaviors that you act out. You have that actual uh, emotional feeling where you go, ah, this is anger. And you have the physiological response, right? So cognition, uh, uh, action, feelings, and physiological changes are the components of emotion, cognition, the thoughts involved with uh, the emotion. So, uh, oh, I hate this person. They're so dumb. Why do they disagree with me, right? Actions, the uh, very rapid typing that you're doing uh, as you're trying to uh, get this person to agree with you, the feeling, right? Uh, that like thought, not, not just the thoughts, but like the actual emotion that you feel, uh, and then the physiological changes. What is happening in your body that allows you to uh, experience anger? So when we're talking about emotions, we're talking about arousal of the autonomic nervous system. So remember, you have your somatic nervous system, which is getting signals from the body and sending signals to the body. Uh, but we also have our autonomic nervous system, which is controlling some of those automatic functions of the body, hormones, heartbeat, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, so when we're talking about emotions, we're seeing those subdivisions of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight response, and the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest response. Uh, both of these work in concert in order to help us get those physiological aspects of emotion. So just a reminder, we have our sympathetic nervous system outflow here, our parasympathetic outflow here, and they're connecting to different parts of our body, right? So for example, respiration, when you are afraid, uh, you might uh, have higher uh, rates of breathing and increased heart rate. Their uh, digestion is going to slow down because your body is preparing for a specific action. So the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems are going to help your body prepare for whatever thing that you are feeling and the things in the environment that are triggering that emotion. So there are a few theories of how emotion works in the body. The first is the James Lang theory which suggests that uh, your arousal in your body and the skeletal action, so any physiological responses in your body, precede any emotional responses. And basically, your emotions are your brain's labeling of the uh, whatever things are happening, right? So my heart's beating real fast and uh, my palms are sweaty, uh, my knees are weak, my arms are heavy, right? If there was vomit on my sweater already and it was mom's spaghetti, then I might label that as being anxious, right? Maybe there's a rap battle that's coming up. So here's the James Lang theory illustrated. So there's some event, in my case, the big rap battle, right? My brain uh, appraises the situation, so that's the thought, the cognitive aspect. Then I have uh, the action, uh, so uh, that's me, you know, uh, in the mirror practicing my rap 
spits. Uh, you can tell I'm very cool because I know all the cool terms. Uh, and then also the physiological flight or fight response uh, that's happening in my body. And then the emotional feeling like, oh boy, I am nervous. As I would say, as a rapper, that is how they talk. So if the James Lane theory were true, that the experience in the body leads to the emotional response, then that would mean two things. One, that people with weak uh, nervous system responses uh, or bodily responses should feel less emotions. And if you're able to increase the amount of somebody's response, you should be able to enhance the experience of the emotion. So, of course, we did research. People who are paralyzed, uh, so they're having an issue with the information coming uh, from the body to the brain or vice versa, they report feeling the same emotions in the same way as they did before the injury. So that's debunking the idea that lessened bodily sensations would lead to lessened emotions. Now, if the autonomic nervous system can't properly output information, uh, then people who have what's called pure autonomic failure are going to feel the same emotions, but less intensely. So in paralysis, you can have the same intensity of emotions, but in autonomic failure, you're going to see diminished feelings of emotions. So what this means is there are other factors involved in how we feel emotions. So to make it even more complicated, because science is never easy, Botox is a chemical that blocks transmission at synapses and nerve muscle junctions, right? So the signals that would usually go are not going. People who experience Botox injections tend to experience uh, weaker than usual emotional responses. Uh, the way they test it is by showing a video that would make you feel an emotional response. So maybe it's like a dog, uh, like seeing uh, its best friend return home. Uh, and like, but the best friend was actually a veteran. Uh, and uh, the dog is like blind now. I don't know. Uh, so, but the dog like recognizes the person, by, right? That would make you feel emotions. But if you have Botox, uh, then that would uh, lessen your experience of that emotion. So that means that there is some part of the body that is related to our experience of the actual emotion. But also, in some cases of brain damage, people will still show normal emotional responses. So if emotions are just a result of what is happening in the body, right, we can look at panic attacks and measure those. Those, uh, if you've never had one, great. They're not fun, uh, but you have a very intense sympathetic nervous system response, uh, rapid heartbeat, uh, fast breathing. Uh, it, to a lot of people, it feels like uh, what they imagine a heart attack would feel like. Some people feel like uh, they're dying. Very fun uh, just generally, like, everybody's like, yeah, I'm glad I had that panic attack. Super fun, right? Uh, so we can use panic attacks, which are a heightened state of bodily arousal, to understand emotion. So if you've ever heard of fake it till you make it, there is some truth to it. Smiling slightly does increase happiness. So if you force yourself to smile, you will feel better. Uh, so if a random stranger talks to you on the subway and is like, you should smile more, they could be a creep who's disrespecting you or 
They could be a neurologist. You never know. You just never. You just never know. They're probably a jerk, and they should just leave you alone, right? Uh, but uh, smiling, forcing ourselves to smile, like you know, try it just real quick. Give yourself a little smile, and, like hold it, and see see if like you do feel a little bit better. Uh, also, uh, forcing yourself to frown uh, leads. Uh, you to rate things as slightly less pleasant. Uh, so if you were to uh, try my, you know, famous food that I make, I could, I literally was trying to name a food. I couldn't think of anything. My my famous cauliflower, right? If you were to try it uh, normally without doing anything, compared to if you forced yourself to frown while trying it you'd be less likely to enjoy it if you force yourself to frown. So our perception of what our body's doing is related to uh, our experience of emotion. So that implies, or that uh, going back to Botox, right? If our body can't uh, express certain, like if we can't smile or frown uh, because of Botox, if it's uh, lessening the our ability to control those facial muscles, that could be why we have issues with experiencing emotions if you were on Botox. Uh, but what's happening in the body is not required for you to feel those emotions, but it is a part of it. So emotion is a construct, if you're not familiar with the word. A construct is just any idea or concept that we kind of just all agree exists, but doesn't kind of really exist, right? We can look at a physiological response, but an emotion is very hard to like put your finger on and measure. Uh, so when we're defining emotion, we have to be aware of the fact that it's not necessarily a concrete coherent whole but it does have aspects to it that can work in concert or maybe not uh so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about emotion right this balance of the thoughts and the feelings and the actions that are related to emotion but don't always work together So the uh, emotions that we experience, they will arouse different areas of the brain. Right now I'm trying to draw the limbic system, those little tubules that, <laughs> that's, my, that's my limbic system. It's pretty, it was pretty good. Uh, it's fading away because it doesn't want to be seen. Uh, no history of my terrible drawing. Uh, but the uh, limbic system is, involved in our experience of emotion. Uh, and when we scan the brain, we can see that certain areas are more active when we're experiencing a specific emotion. See, my drawing of the limbic system was just, just as good as this one. Uh, so we have uh, the cingulate gyrus, the interior thalamic nuclei, the septal nuclei, our frontal lobe, hey buddy, uh, the olfactory bulb, uh, mam mammillary bodies, the amygdala, we're probably going to talk about that one a lot, uh, hippocampus, fornix, and parahippocampal gyrus, uh, or the limbic lobe. So there's no one part of the brain that is like, oh, you point to here and this is the anger part. Oh, this is the part that makes us sad. This is the happy part. Multiple parts of our brain are responsible for emotion. Uh, they work in concert uh, to help us experience emotions. And they are also related to other things aside from just that emotion. So here we can see what parts of the brain might light up in certain cases. So these little yellow areas are lighting up around happiness, 
uh, if you wanted to look at sadness, oh, sadness, oh no, right? Uh, let's see if we can find there's some disgust, those green areas. So no one part of the brain is responsible for one emotion. So let's talk about Lisa Feldman Barrett. Uh, so uh, it sounds like she's in trouble. Well, we need to talk about Lisa Feldman Barrett. Uh, so uh, emotions are a category in the same sense that weeds are a category, right? Weeds are flowers, uh, but we talk about weeds as somehow different than them. Uh, but it's a it's not in any way separate from the world of flowers. We just sometimes don't like weeds, right? So the uh, fact that we uh, perceive weeds as different, even though they aren't, uh, they're all flowers, some are just prettier than others. Very, that's really a, uh, a nice uh, like microcosm of society. Just real quick rant, right? We determine the use of some flowers or others based solely off of their uh, attractiveness. Yeah, that is classic Western society. Wow. Uh, anywho, uh, but in a similar way, right? Emotions are just a social contract. Uh, sorry, construct. We, uh, uh, this is an economics class. They're a social construct. Uh, and so we take specific aspects of our physiology and our psychology and we say these are separate, right? But they're, everything's all woven in together. It's all part of the same system. So there's this idea that we have a limited set of basic emotions, basically like at their simplest form, what can we express emotionally, right? Uh, so happiness, sadness, fear, anger, disgust, surprise, etc. these basic core emotions. Now, when it comes to our understanding of emotions, it's not just the facial expression that we read. We take a lot of things into context, right? Uh, we, the words that have been said, uh, how we're feeling, the situation, right? So it's not just looking at somebody's face and telling what they're feeling. The other thing is somebody's facial expression could show multiple things, right? The feeling of like something being bittersweet where you're happy but sad at the same time. So if it's purely just basic emotions and there are these clear cut delineations and it doesn't really leave room for some of the more complex emotions that we feel sometimes. Another way of looking at it might be that we have these specific little continuums that we look at, and any uh, emotion can be categorized by where it lies on that continuum. So weak to strong, pleasant to unpleasant, how if we're interested in the thing or if we're trying to avoid it, right? Uh, so very strong, unpleasant, uh, avoid might be discussed, right? So here are some emotions. Can you tell who is happy? Who is sad? Who is distrustful? Who is afraid? And one of these people is high on drugs. Just kidding. <laughs> They're all high on drugs. Guys, don't do drugs. So then we can also look at emotion as an activation or an inhibition in the brain. So we have the behavioral activation system, the BAS, and that is activation in, uh, so you see activation in the left hemisphere, especially our frontal and temporal lobes. Uh, so let me draw my little terrible brain right here. So frontal and temporal, right? Uh, so 
ignore that parietal and septal for now. Uh, so you're seeing low to moderate arousal and a tendency to approach. Uh, so this is happiness or anger, right? Uh, when you are angry at something, you want to go towards them and show them what's what. When you're happy about something, like maybe somebody brought you a cake, you're like, oh, I want to go towards that cake, right? So that's what we mean by a tendency to approach. Then we have behavioral inhibition. So this is uh, increased activity of the frontal and temporal lobe uh, of your right hemisphere. Uh, so before we were looking at the left side, now we're looking at the right side. Uh, so the, the, these are your eyes, by the way. Uh, I'm, I'm very good at drawing. I feel like it. Uh, so uh, this is related to attention and arousal. Uh, so the reason is because there's something that we uh, uh, are seeing uh, and it might be dangerous or problematic to us. So we really want to make sure uh, that we're paying attention to it, right? So it's inhibiting our action. So fear is inhibiting. We might want to run away, right? Uh, we're not going to fight it. We're just going to go, ah, this is scary. Uh, or disgust, right? You see something and it's maybe my cauliflower from earlier. It's disgusting. You're not going to eat it, right? But you're focused on it. And you're like, I don't want that cauliflower anywhere near me. It's good. Try it. Did this person win or did this person lose? Look at their face, right? Uh, so based off of that, can you tell? If you can, uh, you might be a psychic uh, or you might be lying to yourself. It's pretty hard to tell because when we're interpreting emotion, we use a lot of context, right? If you just saw this person, you know, miss... Uh, a ball that was flying towards them, uh, then you might go, ah, oh, they're upset, right? If they served and the other person missed, and then that was match point, right? And, uh, you know, something, something, love, tennis terms, 15, 30, 40. Uh, I think I remember playing tennis once. Uh, so if that's the case, then you might say, oh, that person's upset. But without the context, it's very hard to tell. So why do we even have emotions? Well, emotion has an adaptive value, meaning that it helps us uh, it's helped us survive throughout the the ages uh, and eons and you know however long humans have been around. For example, something like fear, right? Uh, fear and anger are very adaptive. You can see this in uh, a lot of animals where if they are angry, they will attack you, right? And that could save their lives. Or if they're afraid, they might try to escape. So when we're looking at emotions, we can see that they serve a survival purpose. They also serve a social purpose, right? They help us communicate our needs to others. If you have ever been around a baby, I'm not sure if you've seen them. They're like uh, small, kind of like pocket-sized humans. Babies use their emotions because they don't really have a lot of language to use, right? So if something is upsetting them, they will cry. If they don't like food, you can see that like you like, you're like, oh, here's a little airplane. And then they're like, right? like, oh, you did not like that? Okay, our baby is not a peas baby. This baby does not like peas, right? Uh, emotions also help us make quick decisions because we perceive situations based off of how we're feeling and those feelings which are immediately there, right? Those can help us decide how to act in a pinch. Emotions also help us make moral decisions. We make moral decisions based off of how we will feel when we'll, uh, after that action has occurred. So let's say 
I want to steal from a store, right? I go into the corner store. I want myself a Snickers bar, right? And I go, it's right there. No one is looking. No cameras. I could steal it. But then, oh, I'd feel so bad afterwards. I uh, wouldn't, I like, I, I know that I'd feel terrible, right? Uh, so I decide not to do it. Or I go, oh, when I have that Snickers bar in my mouth in like 10 seconds, whew, I'm going to feel good, right? So our emotions help us determine what actions we're going to do. We are motivated by the emotions that we feel. When we're contemplating these moral decisions, it uh, activates our prefrontal cortex, which we already know is related to impulse control uh, and uh, judgments and planning uh, and the cingulate gyrus. Uh, so when we uh, will talk in the next slide about some moral decisions, but people who have the highest levels or the strongest levels of autonomic arousal are less likely to sacrifice one person to save five other people. Uh, so that means that they're focusing on the emotional aspect of a decision as opposed to the logical aspect. And that's the thing. When it comes to morals, we seldom make decisions based off of our, uh, off of what is logical, like if you did the math of the situation, we very rarely do that. Uh, if you've ever stayed in a relationship longer than you should have, you know this, right? Uh, so we have uh, like, we're like, oh, this, this feels like the right thing to do, right? This is what I feel like doing. Uh, and then what we can do after we've made the decision is we justify the fact that we've made the decision. This is uh, related to what's called the sunk cost fallacy, which is the idea that once you've invested in something, you're more likely to continue investing in something, even if that investment is wrong, right? So I finally get into med school and uh, I'm like, oh man, I'm finally in med school. And then like my first semester, I'm miserable. I'm like, I don't think I really want to be a doctor. Now, the logical thing is to go, well, I hate this profession, right? There's nothing in it. I thought that I'd like it. I really don't. Uh, so I'm going to drop out of med school and find another career that's going to be more fulfilling. But what we do is we focus on the investment like, oh, well, I'm already like $15,000 in the hole for this semester. Uh, and so I have student loans and how am I going to pay for them? Uh, and uh, my parents would be so disappointed, and I'd feel bad that I'm quitting, so I'm not going to quit. And then you spend two years in, and then it's harder to quit. Then four years, and then it's harder to quit. So even though the logical thing to do is quit, the moment you realize that something isn't for you, that it's not working, right, uh, we continue because we're following the emotional aspect of it, not the logical aspect of it. So the simple question is, if you could sacrifice one life to save five people, would you? Now, the logical answer is yes, right? If I could save more people, then I would. If you value all lives equally, right, then one life versus five lives, five lives is more, right? So you want to save more mathematically, right? Uh, if you have two coupons uh, to go to a restaurant, one, and you can only use one, uh, one is $5 off, the other is $1 off, right? Uh, you use the coupon for $5 if they both expire today. So that is the mathematical, logical decision. Now, moral dilemmas take these situations and apply an emotional aspect to it. So, uh, a trolley is coming down uh, a track, and you see that it's going to hit these five people, right? Uh, now, uh, because the trolley is so loud, you yell at them, you yell, 
uh, and they cannot hear you. Uh, it's too far for you to run and block them. Uh, you would just get hit by the trolley yourself. You see that you're right next to the switch that could change it to this way, but it would hit one person, right? The question is, do you hit the switch, right? Uh, so if you hit the switch, one person will die. If you don't, five people will die. Now, uh, the other thing that uh, this deals with is the, uh, the responsibility that we feel from taking an action versus the responsibility that we feel from not doing anything, right? Uh, so by uh, flipping the switch, is flipping the switch knowing that it's going to kill one person as bad as the feeling that you would feel by not killing that one person and leaving those five to die, right? Uh, so we can see the strong emotional component. You probably already have this like feeling of, oh boy, right? Uh, or maybe you are just like, I will do the logical thing because you're a little, you know, bit of a sociopath and that's okay. Sociopaths are important in society. Uh, so uh, let's take it one step further, right? Uh, you're on a bridge. There you are in your fancy yellow shirt, yellowish, orangish. Uh, and there is a guy uh, just hanging out, uh, looking over the bridge. Uh, and you notice that the trolley is coming. Uh-oh. Uh, you notice that these people here are uh, about to get hit by the trolley. Because you are a master of trolley physics, you know that if you push this guy into the way of the trolley, the trolley will stop saving these five people. So, do you sacrifice one person to save five people? Same question, different situation, right? Uh, so if you do nothing, these five people will get hit by the trolley. Uh, you might say, well, it's not my fault that uh, they were on the train tracks. They should know better. And that is you using logic to justify your emotional choice, right? What we were just talking about. Uh, but if you are looking at it purely logically, right? Sacrificing one person to save five is the logical choice. But we're not going to make the logical choice, or some of us won't make the logical choice. I know personally, I'd have a hard time pushing somebody. Uh, I'd feel really bad about it, right? Uh, I'd also feel bad about not being able to save five people. So, uh, same situation as this, mathematically, but the context might change how we react, right? You might have been okay with doing the switch here, but actually pushing somebody off of a bridge, right, uh, to save five complete strangers maybe, uh, you might be less likely to do that. Same dilemma, different situation. You are one of six people on a life raft. You understand life raft physics. You only need five or you only want five people Otherwise, it will deflate and sink, right? Uh, so, do you push somebody off the life raft to save five people, including yourself? Now that you might die because of one extra person, does that change your moral decision-making? Now that you are the beneficiary of being saved, do you justify your behaviors? Now, there's no right or wrong answer, but this helps us understand this uh, really important role that emotions play when we're trying to make decisions. So, damage to the prefrontal cortex, uh, so let's just remember what our brains look like, right? prefrontal cortex right here, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, this area right here. This is a perfect drawing of a brain. 
it's so good. You've never seen a brain that looks as good as this. Damages to the prefrontal cortex are going to blunt our emotions, so it's going to make it harder for us to make decisions, uh, and it's going to lead to us uh, making more impulsive decisions. So somebody says something mean to them uh, or to us, uh, and we just punch them right in the face without even thinking about it, right? Usually we have a moment of like, okay, this person said something mean. Well, I really want to punch them, but I won't. Let me think of something. You know, like we, we go through all the options before just jumping into punching people in the face. If there is damage to the ventral medial prefrontal cortex specifically, you might see inconsistent uh, preferences, so inconsistent decision-making, and uh, decreased guilt and or trust. So attack and escape, if I say that, uh, that should, you, you might go, that sounds uh, real familiar. What does that remind me of? Fight or flight, perhaps? Oh, and then everybody claps. Everyone's minds are blown, right? Uh, these behaviors, which are related to uh, anger and fear, are closely related physiologically and behaviorally, right? The difference between uh, you being angry versus afraid is essentially, can I tackle this, right? Uh, so... If a uh, kindergartner comes up to you and uh, says, like, yo, what's up, punk? Uh, uh, you want to fight and just, like, punches you in the stomach? Uh, you might go, what's wrong with this kid? And you might get angry. Uh, you might even laugh, right? Uh, now, if, uh, like, a 350-pound weightlifter comes up to you and is like, yeah, what's up? Let's fight, right? Uh, I'm going to beat your butt. And you're like, uh, whoa, 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 whoa right? Uh, that might be a little more intimidating. So similar situation, but whether you feel angry uh, or afraid is kind of based off of your evaluation of how safe you are. So our decision to attack is going to depend on uh, the individual, uh, the person who's feeling the emotion, and the situation, as I mentioned. There's uh, an example that uh, they give of uh, a hamster intruder. So basically, you have a hamster. Rodents are generally very territorial. So you have a hamster, it's in its cage, and uh, you introduce another male hamster. And the uh, initial attack is going to cause activity in the cortical medial area of your amygdala. Your amygdala is related to your fear response. So this increases the hamster's likelihood of attacking back when faced with a subsequent attack. Uh, fun fact, uh, I know you guys are super excited about this. I uh, was doing some research and there was an article from 2003 called Condition Defeat in Male and Female Syrian Hamsters, which actually found that if a hamster is defeated, then uh, the next uh, if another hamster is introduced later, then the defeated hamster is going to assume that it's going to lose. And even if the small, uh, the second hamster is smaller and weaker, the uh, already defeated hamster is going to feel like it can't win. And so it's going to be defeated, even though it should have won. So another aspect of uh, this emotional arousal is how it affects your cognitive belief. One negative consequence could lead to future negative consequences. So here we have our brain, and right there we've got our amygdala. Little cute little thing. See, we can give it a little smiley face. Oh, geez, I'm real happy to see you. Uh, don't touch my cortical medial nucleus. I'm real ticklish. Oh, boy. Uh, that is what an amygdala sounds like. I went to grad school, and that is what I learned. That is how amygdalas talk. That is as... 
factual as you're going to get here. So differences in aggression are going to uh, be based off of your genes and also your environment, right? Uh, so this makes sense. Behavior is shaped by your genes and your environment. So let's say you witness a lot of uh, violence or were a victim of violence in your childhood. Uh, child abuse, maybe uh, there was a shooting, uh, any of these types of things. If you uh, grew up in a high crime neighborhood and there were lots of violent crimes, right, uh, that's going to affect your likelihood of being aggressive in the future. Uh, the uh, exposure to these things uh, is going to cause harm to your brain as it's developing. Uh, it's going to trigger certain parts to focus on the fact that you are not safe, and then you're going to develop that uh, response, either a very aggressive response, so everything is a potential threat, or maybe a more anxious response because everything is a potential threat. So if you remember, when we're studying heredity, uh, we often use twin studies. So twins who were separated at birth and raised in different environments, if they have things in common, then we assume that there's a genetic base, uh, basis to them. If they have things about them that are different, we assume that the environment is the reason for those differences. So uh, we have looked to see how environment does impact violence. Now, there are a variety of issues with designs like that. We can't account for a lot of other things that might have accounted for these changes, but it does seem that there's a little bit of a uh, link with the MAOA gene to aggression. Uh, so the uh, so there's a interaction between uh, uh, your genes and your environment and how that leads into how aggressive of a person you become. So here we can see some interaction between this gene, MAOA. Uh, and uh, the environment, right? So uh, how severe your childhood maltreatment was uh, and how likely you are to uh, ex uh, exhibit antisocial behavior. So uh, lower levels of this gene, right? Uh, lower activity you're going to see are overall related to higher uh, levels of antisocial behavior. Uh, now, if you weren't mistreated at all as a child, we're seeing uh, lower uh, amounts, right? Uh, now, the more mistreatment that there is, the higher uh, chance you'll see antisocial behavior. So we can see that not only do your genes make a difference, right, uh, but the environment makes a difference because overall we're seeing things increase over uh, as the severity of childhood mistreatment increases. Surprise, surprise, male aggressive behavior depends on testosterone. Young men have the highest rates of aggressive behaviors and violent crimes. Uh, if this is new information to you, Hey, now you know. Uh, so uh, on average, men are going to engage in more aggressive and violent behaviors than women. Uh, by aggressive behaviors, we're tending to mean like physical aggression uh, or like intimidation. Uh, usually when we're seeing studies like this, we're talking about those types of aggression, not like relational aggression, uh, which is what we often see in Western society as more typical of women. Uh, so these are forms of uh, uh, aggression that don't rely on physical strength. Uh, they re rely on social strength. So uh, gossiping about people, uh, uh, putting them down uh, socially, uh, um, ostracizing people and uh, excluding them from events, you would see higher rates of those types of aggression uh, in women. 
uh, compared to men. Now, uh, when uh, you increase levels of testosterone in women, you'll see that they increase the amount of time they spend looking at angry faces. So we will show, uh, a study will show like uh, people different faces and measure the amount of time they spend looking at the face. Uh, and also you'll see more arguing during collaborative tasks. So if you've ever wondered why men are so argumentative sometimes, it's because of testosterone. It makes us crazy. Oh, classic men in their crazy emotional ways. Ah, oh, men. Uh, but, you know, testosterone is good for other things. So we can't, we can't just throw away the baby with the bathwater, right? So you can see here uh, different levels of testosterone for different violent crimes or different types of crimes, some not necessarily violent, right? So red, highest levels of testosterone, blue, intermediate levels of testosterone, and uh, yellow, orangish, uh, peach, uh, however you want to describe that color, lower testosterone, uh, tan, sandy, beach, orange, uh, whatever. Uh, so... The, so let's compare like uh, drug offenses, very nonviolent crime, right? Uh, so maybe somebody had too much weed on them back in the day. Oh, back in those days when weed was illegal because people thought that it was super dangerous while alcohol was still very legal. Uh, uh, so uh, let's compare drug offenses to rape, right? Uh, drug, not very violent. Rape, pretty terrible, right? Pretty violent. Uh, so when you look at the high levels of testosterone, you have 23 to 53, right? Uh, when you look at lower levels of testosterone, uh, 53 to 13. So the people who are being uh, uh, convicted and put in jail uh, for super violent crimes, right? Uh, murder compared to burglary, uh, you can see this stark difference in these rates of uh, testosterone levels, right? Uh, so more testosterone is going to lead to more violence. So impulsiveness and aggressive behavior has been linked to low serotonin release. Uh, so we can measure this uh, using one of our body's processes, which is serotonin turnover. So if you remember our little synapse, uh, serotonin is released, right? Uh, then uh, it hits these uh, receptor sites or it's sucked back in. Uh, and then depending on uh, where it is in the process, uh, sometimes what will happen is it will be broken down, right? Uh, when it is broken down, it becomes 5-HIAA. Uh, and you can measure levels of 5-HIAA in your cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, and so if you see lower than expected levels, you will more than likely see higher levels of impulsiveness and aggressiveness. Because if there are lower than expected levels of 5-HIAA, that means that less serotonin is being broken down, meaning that there is less serotonin available. So here we see uh, between different people uh, who have uh, made suicidal attempts, uh, when you measure their levels of 5-HIAA in the cerebral spinal fluid, people who never made an attempt have uh, high levels, right? Uh, people who have uh, attempted once have slightly lower levels, uh, and people who've made multiple attempts uh, have uh, even lower levels. So, of course, we did a study with mice. Uh, so, uh, if you guys want to play a uh, fun studying drinking game at home, uh, take a shot every time we reference a study on rodents. Uh, and that is how you make studying fun. Uh, don't, don't do that. I will not be responsible for my entire class uh, dying of alcohol poisoning. So, don't, don't do it. No. Put that vodka down. Get out of here.
So uh, this sentence is super fun and confusing, so let's just break it down. Social isolation lowered serotonin turnover greatest amount in strains that reacted with greatest amount of fighting after isolation. Thank you, Cengage. Uh, so uh, in the more violent rodents, uh, when they are socially isolated, they're going to have lower amounts of serotonin turnover. So we'll see less 5-HIAA in their cerebral spinal fluid, meaning uh, that we can see that the more violent rats have this lower amount of 5-HIAA. Uh, so also serotonin activity is lower in the younger rodents than adults. Interestingly enough, uh, fighting is more frequent in younger rodents in comparison to older ones. There we go. So lower levels of serotonin turnover also found in other types of violent behavior. Uh, so arson and then suicide specifically by violent means. Uh, so uh, something like a uh, like taking a whole bunch of pills uh, uh, that would not be suicide by violent means. We're talking like uh, using a, uh, a a weapon of sorts. So like a gun, for example. Uh, the or even uh, you you can use your imagination. I'm not gonna like list all the things. Uh, so the uh, relationship, uh, even though we've been talking about serotonin for like uh, five slides, between serotonin and aggression is still small. So we can't just use it as a sole predictor uh, of aggression in an individual, but it can be a clue into what's happening. So all the things that we're talking about, we have to remember that they're all working in tandem. So it's a very delicate balance between environment, genes, chemicals, etc. So again, we don't want to see emotion as just a result of one chemical or one part of our brain. Aggressive behavior is a complex mix of uh, multiple things happening in our brains and our bodies. So, for example, with aggressive behavior, we can look at testosterone, which is going to facilitate that aggressive, assertive, dominant behavior. If you remember, it's an androgen, so those stereotypically masculine traits that we think of are a result of testosterone. Then we have serotonin, which is going to help inhibit our impulsive behaviors. And we have cortisol, which is going to inhibit aggression. So uh, when we're looking at aggressive, aggressive behavior, we have to look at our ratio of testosterone to cortisol. So now let's talk about fear and anxiety. Uh, so when we are, uh, again, we'll recap. Uh, when we're looking at our behaviors, we have to think about how the context uh, and how our own individual predispositions are going to be related to how we deal with a situation, right? Uh, so we don't always behave in the same way in all situations. We make an appraisal of the situation, and that's going to affect the emotional consequences. So our amygdala, uh, remember the little guy that we were looking at earlier? Oh, hi, look at me. I'm in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that is, uh, when we talk about the amygdala, uh, we are usually talking about fear. So just remember the amygdala is related to fear, uh, and it helps us uh, enhance the startle effect, right? Uh, so if I were just like, oh, boo, right? And you're like, oh, right, that startle reflex. Thanks, amygdala. Uh, so it is an extremely fast response to unexpected loud noises. Uh, so I was going to just like yell at you uh, real loud. Uh, but uh, one, I have neighbors. Uh, and two, uh, some of you are probably wearing headphones and I don't want to be uh, responsible for your hearing damage. So you're welcome.
So what happens when something startles you? Well, the auditory information that you get stimulates a part of your pons that tells your neck to tense up as well as other muscles. Why your neck? Because it is one of the most vulnerable parts of your body. Uh, go for the jugular, right? So if you tense your neck, then that's going to, I was trying to underline, it looks like I'm crossing it out. If you tense your neck, right, ooh, uh, then you're protecting your neck from a potential attack. Uh, so that information uh, reaches the pons within uh, three to eight milliseconds, which is very quick. And then that startle response occurs within two tenths of a second. Uh, it has to be quick because if there's something that's about to attack you, right, you wanna make yourself as safe as possible. If you are already tense, then it's going to be a much more vigorous uh, startle reflex. And we can use this to measure anxiety. So we get auditory information, goes to the amygdala, goes into the midbrain, goes into the pons, and then sends that signal out so that we can have that startle reflex. Any issues with this pathway are going to affect our ability to learn fears and our uh, ability to respond to things. Uh-oh, time to take a shot, but don't. Uh, so we uh, did research on rodents. Of course, you pair a stimulus with a shock and they associate the stimulus with the shock. This is classic Pavlovian conditioning, right? So the stimulus becomes a fear signal. Uh, so let's say I have a, a pencil. This is a very good pencil. And every time uh, you see uh, the pencil, uh, you get an electric shock, right? Now, every time you see a pencil, it's going to signal you that danger is nearby. So uh, when you uh, associate things with pain or pleasure, uh, the what is going to happen in the brain is your brain is going to say, ah, I'm safe now, or oh, I'm not safe, right? So if uh, every time you saw a quarter, uh, this is a real good quarter, right? Uh, you got a cupcake, you'd be like, oh man, uh, quarters are great, right? Uh, so you feel safe. But once we get that pencil back, you're like, oh no, something bad's going to happen. Uh, so when we're, uh, when we're looking at things that are associated with pleasure or the absence of danger, uh, that's going to decrease the startle reflex. That's going to tell our bodies to relax. We don't have to protect our neck because nothing's going to hurt us. So the amygdala is getting signals from our uh, visual cortices, our uh, auditory cortices, uh, the pathways that experience pain, uh, all these things are involved with feeling fear, right? Uh, so uh, you're um, uh, being chased by a swarm of bees, right? Uh, you hear uh, the buzz. Uh, you, uh, one stings you, right, in your arm, uh, and uh, you can also see the swarm moving towards you, right? Uh, ugh, scary. Uh, but your amygdala is taking all this information and helping you decide what you want to do. So the things that are crossing through the amygdala uh, help you uh, process your fear of pain, your fear of predators, uh, or your fear of aggressive members of the same species, which are still predators. I don't know uh, why we, I mean, yeah, I guess from a zoological perspective, there's a difference between like a, like a uh, chain predator versus like a terrible person of your own species. Uh, so the, uh, so uh, your amygdala also controls your breathing changes and uh, another helps you identify safe places. Breathing is important. Uh, because of its role in uh, movement, right? Uh, changing uh, your breathing, uh, which is also related to your heart rate, is going to prepare you to move quickly if you need to, uh, let's say, run and hide from uh, a scary lion that's trying to eat you, or murder hornets.
So things that are leaving the amygdala are going to control our fear responses, right? Do we avoid? Do we approach? Uh, so when you see a rat with damage to the amygdala, uh, you're going to see a normal startle reflex, uh, but the uh, any signals that are presented before the noise don't actually modify the reflex. So the star reflex is still there, but it's not affected by any other things in the environment. So let's talk about the beautiful circle of life. Uh, you may have heard of uh, everybody's favorite protozoan, Toxoplasma gondii, right? Everybody's like, oh yeah, a TG, woo woo, right? Uh, so it's a, it, it infects a lot of mammals, but it only reproduces in cats. Uh, so uh, if you've ever heard of toxoplasmosis, uh, you can get it uh, from like, um, you know, touching uh, cat poop. Uh, and uh, like if you're cleaning out litter and it gets somewhere, uh, it can lead to a really nasty uh, infection. Uh, but if you are a rat and you're brewing and you come in contact uh, with uh, the uh, the eggs of uh, Toxoplasma gondii, what will happen is you'll that infection will damage your little rat amygdala. Because of that damage to the amygdala, uh, the uh, you'll approach a cat because it'll just be like, I don't experience fear, baby, right? Uh, but the cat will eat you uh, because cats are very good <laughs> at killing things. Uh, so the rat approaches the cat, it gets eaten, and then the parasite, which was infecting the rat, gets back into the cat, grows within the cat, uh, and then the circle of life continues. It's very beautiful. It's very majestic. So another aspect of anxiety and fear are the long-term aspects of it, right? So we've been talking about uh, specific damages and the immediate effects of them, uh, or uh, the uh, immediate effects of uh, a specific situation, but let's talk about long-term effects. So if you were attacked or you had a fearful experience, you would likely become fearful in a wide variety of circumstances. This is why uh, right after seeing a scary movie, uh, you tend to be pretty sensitive uh, for the rest of the day or the night and even maybe the rest of the week, I remember after Jurassic Park, I'd uh, like lay down in my bed afraid that a T-Rex was going to, first of all, I lived on the first floor of a two-floor building, uh, but uh, I still had this idea that a T-Rex was going to come down, bite through the entire building, uh, and uh, just look at me through the top of the building, uh, and I would just like be there panicked uh, as it was uh, deciding uh, whether or not to eat me, right? Uh, so the, uh, so one fearful experience can lead to a long-term uh, uh, experience of that fear or anxiety. So this relates to the bed nucleus of your striae terminalis, right? This is responsible for long-term generalized emotional arousal. So happening for a long period of time and not just related to the original thing that made you afraid. So here we have our amygdala and right above it, we have the bed nucleus of the striae terminalis. Kluver Busey syndrome is a uh, disorder uh, and it's associated with damage to uh, parts of the brain, the temporal lobes, uh, or uh, even damage to the amygdala. When you see damage to the amygdala, then we'll uh, see some of the uh, symptoms that we're about to talk about. So, specifically, we've seen uh, monkeys with a Kluver Busey that are more tame and placid. They don't display the normal fears that you would see in monkeys when they are presented with a snake or when they're around a more dominant monkey. 
and then they also have impaired social behavior so they have a very hard time learning what to fear so something terrible happens and then usually when something terrible happens the thing associated with that thing you learn that you have to be afraid of that they're going to have a much harder time with that now in monkeys that don't have a damaged amygdala but have a very active amygdala they show they, you'll see that fear to a uh to noises or intruders So when we see scary images or when we see faces of people who are showing fear, uh, we'll have a strong response in the amygdala. We'll even see a stronger response when the meaning is unclear, right? So if we're not really sure what's happening, uh, then that our brains are going to require more time to process that. So we're going to see a stronger response. It also responds more strongly to an angry face uh, that is directed towards the viewer, which would mean, oh, this person might be angry at me, or a frightened face that's directed elsewhere, which would be, oh, there's some danger that you need to be aware of. So anger directed at you, anger averted somewhere else, fear directed towards you, fear directed somewhere else. Because we're not used to anger being directed away from us or fear being directed towards us, the amygdala has to have a stronger response to interpret these bizarre situations. So our response to anxiety is pretty consistent over time. There are some people who are more prone to it. There are some people who are less prone to it. If you have genes for reduced serotonin uptake, uh, you're going to have increased responses to threats, right? Uh, if you have high levels of amygdala response and you are uh, in combat, uh, you're going to see more combat stress but uh, as always, anxiety isn't just dependent on the amygdala. Uh, and uh, we'll talk in a bit about reappraisal as a coping mechanism. Uh, but essentially, the, we're not just emotions, right? We have the ability to uh, uh, reframe our experience, right? So that's kind of our ability to go, well, this bad thing happened and it was frightening, but I learned a valuable lesson, right? There's something good that can come from this. Uh, so when we reappraise, it's going to lessen the stress that we feel. So damage to the amygdala does not stunt your ability to experience emotion. It's not going to turn you emotionless. If you are, uh, have a amygdala damage, then uh, you can still classify emotional pictures without difficulty, uh, but you'll see less arousal from viewing unpleasant photos. So if there were, you know, uh, very gory pictures uh, and you're being shown like scenes from car accidents or, uh, you know, surgeries, right? You wouldn't experience the same amount of arousal that you would normally would had you not received damage to the amygdala. So another disease, Urbach-Weith disease, causes calcium to accumulate in the amygdala until it basically just wastes away. Uh, so uh, there was a case study on a person called SM, and what we saw in her was, uh, one, she was fearless, right? Uh, not afraid of anything. She could draw faces of all, uh, showing different ranges of emotions, but had a really hard time drawing a face that showed fear. Uh, she didn't look people in the eyes, uh, and that lack of fear uh, grew dangerous, right? Uh, think of like simple things, uh, like you're making food and you're cutting vegetables. 
when you're cutting vegetables, there's a little bit of fear of cutting one of your fingers, right? Uh, and that makes you be careful. We often talk about fear and anxiety as a bad thing, but they're very protective. They prevent us from doing things that will endanger us, right? Uh, why do we put on seatbelts? Aside from the fact that uh, it's the law, part of us, and you know, we might be afraid of getting a ticket, we might also be afraid of getting into a bad car accident and you know, being flung from the car. Uh, so that's a pretty unpleasant thing. Uh, so having fear to a certain extent is healthy. That lack of fear is going to be dangerous. So we can see happy, right? Sad, angry, surprised, disgusted, uh, and afraid, right? Uh, you can see that a lot of these are very clear and you can tell what they're experiencing. Uh, but with afraid, the, there was no ability to think of like what that would look like. Uh, so really uh, the amygdala is core and central in our experience of fear and anxiety. So damage to the amygdala affects our ability to recognize facial expressions of fear and disgust. Uh, so if you looked at that disgust photo earlier and you're like, how is that? Is that what disgust looks like, right? Because she was having damage to the amygdala, SM uh, probably had a much harder time representing disgust. So back to uh, the behavioral aspects of emotion, we can often tell how people are feeling based off of just their eyes, right? The wideness of somebody's eyes gives you an indication of their mood. Uh, also, eyebrows, right? Ooh, this person's mad now. Uh, this person's real chill. Oh no, they're sick now. Oh no, right? Uh, so the context of uh, an emotion uh, might make us uh, see something uh, that isn't there. So we take all these things into account uh, when uh, we're looking at emotions. But just simply trying to tell who is afraid and who is af uh, who's afraid and who's afraid. No, who's afraid and who is happy just by looking at their eyes, we have a much easier time doing that. So let's start talking about some anxiety disorders. One is panic disorder, uh, where you have fe uh, frequent panic attacks. Uh, so once again, panic attacks are frequent periods of anxiety, uh, rapid breathing, increased heart rate, sweating and trembling. Feels like you're dying, feels like you're having a heart attack, a very frightening experience. It's the sympathetic nervous system dialed up to like 15, right? It's more common in women than in men. Uh, it's more common in adolescents and uh, young adults, and there is uh, a possible genetic component. Interestingly enough, people who are hyperflexible uh, are 50% uh, of people with panic disorder have hyperflexibility, uh, so joint laxity. Uh, it's also linked to abnormalities in the hypothalamus, decreased levels of GABA, and increased levels of orexin. Then we have post-traumatic stress disorder. So you have a traumatic event. It could be combat. It could be being robbed at gunpoint. It could be a car accident. And then you have frequent uh, recollections and flashbacks to it or nightmares related to that traumatic event. Uh, there's also hyper uh, vigilance and hypersensitivity, right? Always feeling like you might be in danger and then reactions to noises uh, that might remind you of that. So maybe you get into a car accident uh, and you remember the sound of one car hitting the other. And then uh, one day they're taking out the garbage uh, on your street and you hear the sound of uh, the garbage can being flipped over, right? And then it brings you back to the car accident. Uh, 
Uh, not everybody who has a traumatic incident gets post-traumatic stress disorder, and having a smaller hippocampus might uh, predispose, uh, predispose some people to getting post-traumatic stress disorder. So uh, one common way to relieve you from anxiety are benzodiazepines. Uh, these are a class of anti-anxiety dr drugs, which include uh, Valium and Xanax. Uh, they bind to uh, GABA receptors, uh, which is inhibitory, right? Uh, so your brain's going, ah, ah, panic. Oh, we got to do all these things, right? And GABA goes, no, 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 no. Baby, baby, calm down. It's okay. Right, uh, so they uh, exert their effects on the amygdala, the hypothalamus, the midbrain, and other areas. So benzodiazepines aren't GABA agonists. They're not actually uh, triggering the release of GABA, nor are they mimicking the effects of GABA. What they do is they affect the receptor. Uh, so by affecting the receptor, it makes your brain more sensitive and responsive to GABA. Uh, so I'm not sure if I mentioned this, the uh, issue with mixing benzodiazepines uh, and uh, alcohol is because alcohol releases more GABA in your brain. Uh, GABA or uh, benzodiazepines make GABA more effective in your brain. These two together, their effects aren't one in one. They're one in one equals five, right? So it's a multiplicative effect, which is why uh, you can see people who take uh, Valium and drink alcohol. Uh, some people lose their lives as a result of that. Uh, so you have to be very careful with mixing those types of drugs because of the mechanisms, right? Uh, so, but uh, when we're talking about benzodiazepines, they just make this receptor more receptive to GABA that already exist in the synapse. So alcohol is an anxiety reducer uh, because it affects your GABA receptors. Uh, and that is why if you're feeling a little stressed and you have a little drink, you feel a little better, right? Uh, it's also intoxicating because it's telling your brain to slow down. Uh, there is a drug, uh, RO15, 4513, and it blocks the effect of alcohol on your GABA receptors. Uh, so if you take it, then you won't get intoxicated, uh, which is uh, great for uh, treating alcoholism. Okay, I can't be mad at scientists now. First of all, take a shot, but don't. Uh, but they gave rats alcohol, and this is everybody's drunk friend. Yo, man, where my keys? Oh, my head hurts so much. Yo, I'm, I gotta go home, man. It's like, no, Mr. Meowskers, you are not, you are not, do not, do, and like, yo, I'm not a cat. Why do you keep on calling me Mr. Meowskers? That's not my name. I'm like, Mr. Meowskers, you are too drunk to drive. That is your name, right? Uh, so they got both of these rats drunk, uh, but they gave this one the experimental drug, and within uh, two minutes, its uh, coordination uh, returned. So it's very interesting that we can now uh, make a drug that blocks the effect of another drug. Uh, so very... I mean, we've been able to do that before. Uh, this isn't a new thing. Uh, the, but uh, when we're looking at like alcoholism and treatments for any type of uh, substance use disorder, a drug like this can be very helpful. So wouldn't you know that stress is related to your health? Interesting. Uh, behavioral medicine looks at the effects uh, on your health of your diet, smoking, exercise, stressful experiences, and other behaviors, right? So it's not just what's already going on in your body. It's the things that you're doing and the things that are happening to you and how they affect your levels of stress overall. Uh, your emotions and other uh, experiences can influence uh, your uh, susceptibility to illness and your likelihood of recovery, 
it's been shown that people who have a more positive outlook are more likely to have better recovery. So if you're going into uh, uh, physical therapy and you're like, oh, well, I'm going to get better. Uh, there's nothing that's going to stop me from getting better. They say three months. I'm going to do it in two. Then you might actually do it in two, right? If you, uh, the first day of physical therapy, you're like, this is too hard. I'll never get better. Uh, then your recovery is going to take a much longer time. Then we have uh, Hans Self. So uh, what they did was they said that stress is the nonspecific response of the body to any demand that is made upon it. Uh, and uh, they developed the general adaptation syndrome, which is how our body responds to stress. So we have three stages of the general adaptation syndrome. The first is the alarm stage. Uh, think of this as your initial fight or flight response, right? Uh, you're having that sympathetic nervous system activity. Once the threat is gone, what could happen is the resistance stage. So that initial fight or flight re uh, response declines, but your uh, adrenal cortex is releasing cortisol and other hormones to make sure that you're still alert. Uh, so maybe you were walking down the street at night and there was some scary person uh, who was yelling uh, something incoherent and you're like, oh, that's dangerous. But then they uh, walk past you, right? Uh, and then you get out of their like range and you're like, oh, okay, they're, I'm a few blocks away from them. Your brain might still be saying, well, let's continue to be alert because something could happen at any time. Uh, so that would be the resistance stage. You're no longer feeling that initial fight or flight response, but your brain is still keeping you prepared for a potential threat. Now, what can happen is after a long period of stress, your body is out of energy and that causes exhaustion. So think of it as um, like, so maybe during the semester, right? You look at all the work that you have to do. It's the first week and you're like, oh, there are, I have five group projects, 20 tests, 73 papers, right? That first uh, time that you look at the syllabus, you're like, oh, can I do this? Right? Alarm. Uh, now, the entire semester, you might not be thinking about uh, each assignment, so you're not having that fight or flight response. But what could be happening is your body knows that it's something that you have to deal with eventually, so you're in that resistance stage. Then what happens over a long period of time is you have exhaustion. Your body can't uh, take it anymore, and you might get sick in the middle of semester, uh, the semester uh, right around like midterms. Uh, some people get sick like right after finals week, right? Everything is done. Uh, and what our brains and bodies can do is if we know how long a stressor is supposed to last, then our brains will conserve uh, energy and keep us prepared for that. Uh, so as you might know, uh, when I'm not teaching, I also do taxes and tax season is very defined from around the beginning of February to April 15th. Uh, unless there's something changing the tax deadline, uh, uh, I know that I'm going to be very stressed. Uh, and I know uh, that that is when I am very likely to get sick. So usually uh, sometime around uh, like uh, late February to March, I'll get sick. Uh, and uh, I always know that sometime during tax season, uh, I'm going to reach that exhaustion stage. Uh, so then I have a week uh, during uh, tax season where I just stay home and I don't do anything uh, because I'm recovering uh, because I know that like at just a certain point, my body just reaches exhaustion and I have to recover. So uh, Soplowski argues that uh, today we're dealing with a lot more prolonged stress. So if you're noticing uh, from a scientific 
you point that weirdly enough there's a lot of uh stress related illnesses and a lot more psychiatric problems in industrial societies it's because we're dealing with a lot of stress all the time right uh, a lot of people live paycheck to paycheck, and that's pretty stressful, right? If every month you're not sure if you're going to be able to afford your basic necessities, then you're going to be more stressed all the time, right? And there are lots of things that could go wrong. Uh, is it uh, your car that's going to give you issues? Like, you know that a repair is going to be coming up soon, but what's it going to be? Uh, is it going to be a battery that needs to be replaced? What are rotors? Why do those need to be replaced, right? Uh, and then you're dealing with your job, which is stressful, which doesn't pay you enough to afford things. And now there's a weird pain in your side. Is that cancer? Are you going to die? Uh, if you're not, are you going to be able to afford staying alive? Like, uh, it's a very, uh, like, our lives are just filled with stress all the time, right? Uh, so that could be why we're seeing a lot of mental illness in our society. So these long-term inescapable issues, you're always going to have to pay rent or mortgage or a car note or uh, your health care premiums. Uh, this leads us to exhaustion. So when we are talking about stress, we're talking about two systems in the body. We have your sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight response, and then we have your HPA axis, which is your hypothalamus, H, pituitary gland, P, and adrenal cortex, A. <laughs> Just kidding. A. So the HPA axis is your dominant response to prolonged stressors, so that resistance stage. Uh, when the hypothalamus is activated, it tells the pituitary gland to secrete adrenocorticotropic hormone, uh, ACTH, and that tells the adrenal cortex to secrete cortisol. Uh, so uh, cortisol is useful in getting your body and brain to be ready uh, and energized to deal with a difficult situation. It's also then called the stress hormone. Hypothalamus, anterior pituitary, ACTH, adrenal cortex, cortisol. That's how your HPA axis works. Let's talk about our immune system. So our immune system protects us by producing leukocytes, white blood, uh, white blood cells. B cells are a specific type of leukocyte uh, that are formed, or rather they mature in the brain marrow and they secrete antibodies. Antibodies are little Y-shaped proteins that will attach to particular uh, kinds of antigens. Uh, and antigens are the uh, surface proteins that uh, are generating your antibodies. So when we're fighting something, we have our T cells, which will attack the intruding thing directly and help other T cells or B cells multiply. And we also have natural killer cells. These are leukocytes that attack tumor cells or cells that have been infected with viruses. So if you were infected with something, uh, your leukocytes as well as other cells will produce very small proteins called cytokines. These help combat the infection and tell your brain that you are sick. Uh, cytokines will stimulate the release of prost uh, prostaglandins, uh, and these are responsible for your feelings of fever, sleepiness, your lack of energy. When you sleep and when you're inactive, your body will conserve energy. So you might have wanted to go outside and ride a bike or something, but instead of wasting your energy on that, your body will save energy so that it can fight the illness. Producing the fever helps your body create an unwelcome environment for these invading uh, little intruders, so viruses, bacteria, whatever.
So here uh, we have a natural killer cell attacking a tumor cell. It just injects it with chemicals that kill it. So uh, your body just says, this is something that we do not need. Let's kill it. Uh, now, sometimes what can happen is uh, bacteria can uh, enter uh, your skin. So maybe you got a cut, right? Uh, so uh, the bacteria uh, enters and just flowing in there. Uh, and here's the bacteria, and there's a little antigen on the bacteria. Now, one of your B cells can attach to the bacterium, uh, uh, and now the antigens are exposed. Uh, and what will happen is uh, the T cell uh, will, uh, sorry, uh, the T cell uh, will help the B cell to divide, uh, and some of those cells will uh, start to, uh, will multiply, and because they're multiplying, they will secrete the antibodies specific uh, to this little antigen here, which means uh, that uh, you're creating the thing that's going to help destroy these bacteria. Uh, and then some B cells will differentiate into memory cells so that if you have the same thing present in the body in the future, you're ready to fight it. And also, just remember that cytokines are going to be released, telling the brain that you're fighting this war, right? Uh, so this could be a cut in your leg, but because this chain of events happens, uh, the cytokines tell your brain, oh, we're finding a little infection right now. Let's, uh, let's maybe slow down a little bit. Uh, let's feel a little tired. Let's really focus on keeping us safe. So in case you were thinking of a fun profession that you can say that you were part of uh, in order to impress your friends and family, consider psychoneuroimmunology, right? Uh, that is a lot of adjectives. Psychoneuroimmunology deals with the way that our experiences alter the immune system. Uh, it also looks at how our immune system influences our central nervous system. Uh, so this back and forth between our experiences and our immune system and our immune system and our psychology. So when we are stressed, uh, we are going, our nervous system is going to activate our immune system. That's going to increase production of our killer cells, our leukocytes, and our cytokines. And our cytokines are helpful for combating infections, but they also trigger prostaglandins. Prostaglandins trigger inflammation in the body. So we can see that a, something psychological like a stressor can lead to this immune system response, which will lead us to experience physiological symptoms. So for experiencing stress for a very long period of time, right, that resistance stage, it can produce symptoms similar to depression. We'll feel tired and weak, and we might not be as active or interested in doing things. It can weaken our immune system because it's uh, active and it's doing things all the time, but it's not actually fighting an infection, uh, and it can harm our hippocampus, right? Uh, overstimulation, uh, uh, or any type of toxins that we're exposed to, uh, that's going to damage the neurons in our hippocampus. And if we're stressed, we're going to have issues with learning new things, right? If you've ever been very stressed uh, and trying to be in class, right, uh, it's very, that's going to be a lot more difficult for you because your hippocampus uh, can't do its job. So take a shot, we studied mice, uh, but don't. Uh, there are genes that are related to how vulnerable or resilient you are to stress. Uh, so it, the, regardless of your genes, there are things that you can learn to do to help with your stress responses. Breathing is one thing. If you learn to control your breathing and slow it down, that can help put you in that parasympathetic nervous state. 
exercise is good for you, meditation, distraction. So if something is stressing you out, being able to go, this is stressing me out. Let me focus on another thing right now. And also just addressing the issues. So sometimes just going, well, I'm stressed about this class. What can I do to make it less stressful for me can be very helpful. Also social support. Uh, your social network is so important in the, your mediation of stress. Uh, so if you have people who can help you, uh, either by fixing the problem or uh, offering solutions, or just help you feel less alone, you're going to feel better. Uh, so social support will reduce responses in uh, your various parts of your brain, including the prefrontal cortex. Uh, so it's just like uh, taking a Xanax, except less addicting. And you can spend time with friends and drink alcohol and not worry about potentially dying. So what determines resilience, right? Why is it that some things are very stressful to some people and not stressful at all to other people, right? Uh, it, some people, if their phone dies, they're like, well, my phone's dead. Not a big deal, right? Other people, it's the end of the world. Same situation, right? Different levels of resilience. So one thing is our genes. Uh, so we have these predispositions to experiencing stress, uh, our social support, our physical health, right? Uh, if we are eating well uh, and we are healthy, uh, we are more likely to be resilient to stress. If we are very hungry and we are tired, right? Little things are going to be much more stressful. And then also previous uh, stressful experiences, how we've handled those stresses and how many things that we've been dealing, right, are uh, dealing with. Uh, so resilience is not easy to investigate, but it's important to understand these differences in how we deal with stress in order to understand how stress impacts us. And that is all for this chapter. So go do something relaxing, you know, take care of yourself, uh, watch a show, uh, text a friend, uh, you know, pet a fuzzy animal. Uh, my cat has been this entire time yelling at me. So right now I'm holding him down because he's trying to fight so he can just go and meow at me. I know you want to meow, but I'm not going to let you because I'm not done recording yet. I'm not done recording yet. So I'm going to hold you like a little baby. So find something uh, that makes you uh, less stressed uh, because uh, now you know how it can affect you. Isn't that right, you cute little guy? You're so cute. Oh, you're so mad at me. He's so mad at me right now. Okay, take care.